All right, everybody. Uh, today we'll be talking about marriage and family. And um, <clears throat> marriage and family is one of the many uh, what anthropologists and other social scientists called cultural universals, meaning that every culture has some version of a marriage ritual and every culture has some concept of family and kinship. Um, next week we'll end up talking about kinship. Um, and that's, of course, another cultural universal. But today we're going to focus down on marriage. And the funny thing about marriage and kinship is I'm never quite sure which lecture to give first because they're certainly interrelated. Effectively, marrying somebody is bringing them into your family and causing your two families to become not entirely merged, but certainly uh, allied with one another. So um, every culture has some concept of marriage, which means that marriage as a cultural trait is either really old, probably, or just a really good idea. Uh, it could be, too, that marriage simply came about amongst humans uh, because it takes so long for us to have a child. Uh, and because of our bipedal nature, we're so vulnerable when we have a child and our children take a long time to develop. So it kind of takes two parents to take care of this big brained uh, immobile child uh, for such a long period of time. So like I mentioned, marriage is one of the very few cultural universals. And like I said, every culture in the world has some sort of concept of marriage. But just because every culture has some version of it, that certainly doesn't mean that it's always the same. Uh, while it's probably one of, if not the most common cultural phenomenon, uh, I would estimate because of that, it's one of the most variable, right? Because marriage is so old, because marriage is spread across so many different cultures and so much geographic space, it's had a lot of time and a lot of isolation in terms of one marriage ceremony from another, and that left it kind of free to vary. And so we see a lot of differences uh, in how cultures handle marriages, what the marriage ceremony is like, how much your family is involved or how little your family is involved, how many people you're allowed to marry, all these kinds of things. So just because every culture has some form of marriage, it certainly does not mean that every form of marriage from one culture to the next is in fact the same. So here we have three different pictures. Um, on the left, we have a couple in a kind of classic westernized marriage kind of scenario. They're very intimate. They're very close to each other. Um, it's a very loving scene. The woman is in a white dress and the man is in a tuxedo, right? So that's kind of what we expect, at least in our culture, in terms of marriage. Now, in the middle are two cute teddy bears. And <laughs> they are getting married in a westernized fashion. And I use the teddy bears um, because despite the fact that there are no uh, clear indications as to which one is the gender male and which one is gendered female in the marriage, we have expectations about a marriage ceremony such that despite the fact that these are anthropomorphic teddy bears, you can still tell a lot of things about that marriage. You can tell that the uh, teddy bear on the left is the female because she's wearing the classic white dress. You can tell that the teddy bear on the right is the man. And you can tell despite the fact that they're teddy bears that they're getting married because they're wearing formal marriage attire. So uh, beyond providing a cute picture for the lecture, what that does is it tells you, you have a lot of expectations about what a marriage ceremony should look like. Um, and a lot of um, preconceived notions, right? such that you can put a white dress on a teddy bear and a suit on a uh, male teddy bear and you can tell that they're getting married based on the, the garments they're wearing and you can tell that which one's male and which one's female based on our expectations of how that marriage ceremony should go. On the far right, we have a marriage ceremony in India and we can tell, I think, even though it's cross-cultural that those two individuals are getting married because they're wearing highly formalized garb um, and that they're kind of staring straight forward. But if you compare this photo on the right 
to the photo on the far left, you'll see that there are very different ideas about what a marriage ceremony photo should look like. Um, the two on the right are hardly touching at all. It's very formal. It's certainly not intimate. They're both kind of looking upward. They look very serious. Uh, the couple in the westernized marriage are very informal, even though they're wearing formal attire. They are very affectionate toward each other. Um, and that's kind of allowed, maybe even encouraged in our marriages and not certainly encouraged in all other marriages. Also, you can see that their dress isn't exactly, for those on the far right, exactly what we expect people to be uh, getting married in, but we can still tell based on the formalized nature, based on the flowers behind them, that that is what they're doing. So there are some universal aspects to marriage and that it's almost always formal, uh, or at least it should be, it's, it's expected to be. If you're not formal in your marriage, you'll find out that people will talk about it. And that, you know, though the clothing may vary, um, we can still tell the marriage is going on. However, the expectations of what that formal wear might look like or the behaviors at a wedding, the intimate loving setting on the left and the very formalized uh, standing uh, non-intimate setting on the far right, uh, that expectations of what should happen at a marriage and things like that can vary quite a bit. So marriage is defined anthropologically as a culturally sanctioned union between two or more people that establishes certain rights and obligations between the people, between them and their children, between them and their in-laws. Such marriage rights and obligations most often include but are not limited to sex, labor, property, child rearing, exchange, and status. That is one really big definition. And I think it's a bit shocking for those used to the capitalist westernized notions of marriage. Marriage in our society is about love. It's about romance. It's about finding the perfect person, despite the fact that more than 50 percent of marriages in the United States end up in divorce. And it's very it's going to be expensive. It's going to be a party. And I think some of the aspects of this anthropological definition get left out. We don't think about the rights and obligations between them and their children, between them and their in-laws. We think of the rights and obligations between the two people getting married. We don't think about marriage rights beyond sex and living together. We don't think about labor, property, child rearing, exchange, and status. But all of those things are encoded in our cultural expectations. We expect, for instance, that them and the, that those two people, if they have children, will raise them. That it won't be grandparents that raise them. It won't be aunts and uncles that raise them. So we do have a concept that you get married, you raise your own children. While that seems rather obvious to us, it's not that way in every culture. So you get married, you raise your own children. Your two families don't really have much obligation to each other. Um, and that's because we practice what's called neo-local residence patterns, meaning that married people get married and then set up a neo, new, locality household. And that's not that way in every culture either. So we have less expectations between the relationships between the two families that are being joined, but other cultures certainly have extreme expectations, obligations, rights, and so on uh, between the two families being joined. Um, labor, we do have some expectations about labor. Most married couples in the U.S. and westernized societies share a bank account, for instance. Some don't. Uh, we have a concept of property. You will probably own your house with your significant other, right? You won't often have one person who owns a house in a marriage and one person that does not, right? That they both own a house together. Um, we already discussed child rearing, that of course we have the expectation that those two people will raise that child. Uh, we have, do have expectations about exchange. Uh, if it's a marriage between a man and a woman, we expect that the man will provide an engagement ring to the woman. Um, if it's a marriage between a man and a man, that can kind of be negotiated. Same deal with a woman and a woman. Uh, and we used to have, um, we still have expectations about status. Uh, the fact that traditionally speaking, though not always, the woman will take the man's last name. That's a status thing, right? And in fact, women change from miss to missus. That's a status thing. It's indicated in their name. Our status, even though it's becoming less prevalent, is still very gendered in how the status of individuals change when they get married, right? It doesn't have to be that way, but traditionally it's been that way. And for many people, it's still the norm. So <clears throat> it's harder for us to think about in our society that pushes love and neo-locality, buying a new house. Um, it's some way, in some ways, it's hard to think that we have concepts of 
what should happen in terms of child rearing, exchange and status, because those are kind of social norms that are very ingrained in our society. But our culture is telling us, hey, you're going to get married. Those two people that get married are going to raise their own children. They're going to live in a new house. They're going to share property. They're going to exchange vows, a ring. They're both going to wear rings. And they both kind of gain status when they get married, right? So we do have those expectations. And those expectations are certainly wrapped up in the marriage. And those expectations certainly vary from culture to culture. So this slide just summarizes the kinds of different things that so your culture tells you about marriage. In other words, you have social norms within your culture, our culture, uh, that tells you how many males may be in a marriage, how many females can be in a marriage, how many non-binary, non-gender non or third gender individuals can be in a marriage, if at all, how related the people getting married may be. Who can you marry once you fit all those obligations? Does one side, one family, or the other have to pay for the marriage? And if so, how? And additionally, where you live afterwards. The point being that your culture answers each of these questions in turn. And while we feel that our answers to these questions are somewhat obvious or cognitive, in fact, different cultures answer these questions very, very differently. All right, regarding who you can marry, some groups require endogamy, meaning marriage within a group. In other words, you're required to marry within a certain cultural group. And some groups, cultures, families, whatever, require exogamy. You have to marry outside a certain cultural group. Which do we have? We, of course, have both. Um, in most states, you have to marry somebody outside your immediate family. Right. We know that genetically two people within the same immediate family having children is bad. Uh, it leads to birth defects. Believe it or not, in many states, you can actually marry your first cousin. It's not recommended and it's certainly stigmatized, but it is legal in many places. Um, and sadly, we still have some concepts of endogamy in our culture. Uh, many religions certainly require people to marry with own, in their own religion. Um, and will certainly some will even kick you out of a church or a religion if you fail to marry within a certain religion. Sadly, some people still believe in racial endogamy, meaning you should marry within your own race. Um, and some people believe in class endogamy, and we still kind of believe in class endogamy. In fact, women are highly stigmatized if they marry above their class. If a lower middle class individual marries a really upper uh, class individual, especially if they're a woman, we have terms for them that are derogatory. Uh, for instance, and not that I'm interested in this at all, but were I to marry or get engaged to Paris Hilton, the tabloids would have a field day with that. There would be things like fuzzy anthropologist guy is now engaged to Paris Hilton. What's she thinking, right? That they would have a problem with that. We kind of expect movie stars to marry movie stars, and we expect rich people to marry rich people. And when that doesn't happen, we question their motivations. So in many ways, though we don't strictly come out and say it, we still have within our culture concepts of endogamy. These people should marry these people. These people should marry these people. Now, certainly people cross those lines, but we tend to gossip and uh, use other mild social sanctions against them when they do that. So while you might say, oh, we don't have exogamy or endogamy, we certainly do. We have expectations about who you should marry um, as a culture writ large, and certainly your family will have concepts uh, exogamous and endogamous concepts about who you should marry as well. And so while we review that other cultures have significant and harsh ideas of endogamy and exogamy, keep in mind, we certainly have those concepts in our culture as well. So endogamous examples, as I mentioned, requ certain re religions require uh, endogamy. And um, this is very prevalent in systems known as caste systems. Uh, a caste system, such as that found in India, is when a culture requires class endogamy, and that class endogamy is genetically reinforced, meaning that you can, if you're Brahmin, uh, the highest caste in India, in a traditional Indian culture, you can only marry another Brahmin. 
right? This is still prevalent today. You still see arranged marriages. There are, in fact, people who work in the United States whose sole job it is is to find uh, people from India traditional marriages that can take place here in the United States. So if you move to the United States and you are Brahmin caste and your parents and you want a traditional marriage, um, what they will do is you will put in your social status, your caste, uh, what you do for a living, how much money you make, all this kind of stuff. And these people, their job is to find an appropriate marriage partner for you in the United States. So you may be living in New York. You may be working as a medical doctor. You may be Brahmin caste. And then they might hook you up with a guy in California who is Brahmin, who is a lawyer, and they're going to arrange that marriage for you because it is very important that you find somebody within the same caste, which is your social class, in the same education level and things like that. And there are actually people at events uh, where people pay to go and people, consultants who do exactly this. Um, so this is still important within people living in very traditional cultures. So exogamy examples, of course, you can't marry your cousin in some places in the United States. Uh, some states it is legal. Um, and obviously you can't marry somebody in your immediate family. Uh, and we've codified that in law. And then often in clan systems, which is something we will talk about next week, uh, that you must marry outside your clan. So if you're in the Raven clan, you can't marry somebody in the Raven clan. So there are a lot of cultures that require some form of exogamy. All right, so we have quite a bit of a stigma about this in our culture, but many cultures actually support more than two people uh, being involved in a marriage. And anthropologists have come up with various terms to talk about how many people can be in a marriage and what the genders of those people um, are in the marriage. So we're relatively familiar with monogamy. That's one uh, person being married to another person. Technically, that definition means that they're married to them for life. There is also polygamy. We tend to use the word polygamy to mean multiple wives. Technically, that's not right. Polygamy includes any marriage in which there are more than two people. Uh, polygyny is multiple wives, sometimes or maybe even often, who are sisters, as we saw in Anka's Big Mocha. They weren't sisters, but they did practice polygyny. Polyandry is one woman to multiple men, nearly always brothers. And serial polygamy is technically what we would do in the United States, though we would tell people that we practice monogamy, because technically what this is, this means that you're married to multiple people throughout your life, but you're only married to them one at a time. And as long as more than half of marriages in the U.S. end up in divorce, we are technically serial polygamists. <clears throat> so monogamy doesn't need too much of an explanation. It's one person to another person. Technically, by this definition, though, it's one person to another person for life. In our society, of course, we get to choose, though our family attempts to have and often does have quite a bit of input. Uh, we get to choose who we marry. Arranged marriages aren't really common in North America or the United States, but sometimes a marriage partner is chosen at birth or later at life. Um, this is often the family's doing. Often the family chooses who you'll end up marrying. Uh, and often the preferred marriage partner in many of these societies, certainly not all of them, but many of these societies is a parallel cousin or a cross cousin. A parallel cousin is your mother's sister's child or your father's brother's child. A cross cousin is your mother's brother's child or your father's sister's child. So a parallel cousin is the child of your aunt or uncle of the same gender. So if it's your father's brother or your mother's sister, a cross cousin is the exact opposite, meaning that it has to be your father's sister or your mother's brother's child. Uh, this is pretty common in societies that are matrilineal or patrilineal, um, and we'll discuss why that is later. But the point is that often this is done to keep uh, some kind of inherited good in the family. So if you marry your cousin, you can both inherit the thing, and then you get to keep it. Now, I know some of you are going, ew, that's gross. Technically, genetically speaking, it is okay. Uh, 
to marry your cousin, uh, you only share on average 12.5% of the same DNA with them, and typically that's okay. I know, we have a significant stigma, but in many cultures they do do this. Now, when most people think of polygamy, they're actually thinking of polygyny. This is multiple women married to the same man. This does not mean that in every culture, every man has multiple wives. In fact, it's usually rich or very accomplished men that have multiple wives like Anka. Often only rich men have multiple wives. And in truth, this is odd, it'll take some explanation, but 85% of the world's societies allow for this. Now that doesn't mean that 85% of the people on the planet have the option to be in a marriage that is practicing in a uh, polygyny, polygynous way. Um, what that means is if we ca counted each culture, the entire United States culture is one, the culture of the tiny island of Hawaii or the islands of Hawaii or a place with a very small population, one little tiny island still also counts as one, right? That means that 85% of the world's cultures allow polygyny. It does not mean that 85% of the world's people live in cultures that allow polygyny. I imagine that number would be much, much lower. Um, there are lots of examples of societies that allow this. Many Islamic societies allow this. Mormons allow this. Many hunter-gatherer societies allow this. Anka's culture allows for this. And I think there's a lot of evolutionary reasons why this was so common in the past and why it has persisted even to modern day. Um, and it has to do with our biology <laughs> um, because men are biologically programmed in many ways to be risk takers. Um, that's because we can't bear children. Uh, your insurance company, your car insurance company knows this, right? Despite the fact that women statistically will have more uh, accidents than men, men's car insurance costs more. And the reason for that is because the one or two accidents that men will have will be so outrageously expensive compared to the multiple accidents that women tend to have. Um, and that's often because men try to do stupid stuff to impress other people. It's somewhat biologically programmed into our uh, genes, we think. And so because of this, uh, many societies require men to do foolhardy and often dangerous things before they get married, or at least encourage them to do so. And so in a lot of societies where that is required, polygyny emerges <laughs> because men go off and do stupid things and sometimes die, and then they are left with an overabundance of women. Uh, and so men who have pulled off these foolhardy things uh, are then encouraged to have multiple wives. This is usually in most cases, a very bad in terms of gender stratification. In societies that practice polygyny, for the most part, women's rights are reduced. Uh, meaning that if multiple wives are present within a marriage or there's potential for that, uh, there's greater gender stratification, meaning women often have less rights. This isn't always the case, but often these two things go hand in hand, unfortunately. The classic of example of that is that some uh, portions of the Islamic faith allow men to have multiple wives. Typically, this is done uh, amongst rich men. And in some facets of the Islamic faith, we also see severe gender stratification, such as women being required to cover up in public. Now, I'm not saying that all cases of women being required to cover up in public is uh, gender stratification, and that's something you need to examine on your own and kind of think about. But what we find is that when there is polygyny being practiced, usually gender stratifications and requirements of women are higher. Polyandry is when one woman is married to many men. Often they are brothers. This is really, really rare. Um, it only occurs, to my knowledge, among the Inuit, the Marquesian Islanders of Polynesia, and the Tibetans in Central Asia. Um, but in total, fewer than a dozen societies uh, do this. So take a look at this picture. Um, here is a family. Uh, 
And initially, upon looking at this picture, most people from a westernized society will assume that there are two husbands in this picture and two children, but in fact, there are three husbands in this picture. That young man on the bottom right is also a husband to that woman. Um, however, this practice in many cases uh, is really, really unstable, and it's certainly the case in Tibet. All right, so in this portion of Tibet, there's very little farmland because they live high in the mountains. Land is inherited by males, typically groups of brothers. And in this society, one set of brothers marries one woman. They practice polyandry. Uh, usually, the only, el only the eldest males actually mates with the woman. Um, so the question is, why do they do this? Uh, the main reason is, if you start with 160 acres of land, for instance, and you marry, uh, you have multiple sons, let's say four, and they all inherit the land and you divide it evenly amongst them, then each one of them gets 40 acres. Now, if they each had two sons, they would divide the land amongst them and then they would end up with 20 acres. They each had two sons, they would divide the land amongst them and they'd end up with 10 acres, five acres, two and a half acres, 1.25 acres, until you simply don't have enough land to farm, probably somewhere around the 20 acre mark. So to solve this problem where farmland was very rare, they came up with the practice that multiple brothers would marry one woman. A, it reduces the amount of children they have, thus reducing the amount of male children who inherit the land, and B, it keeps the land all in one pile, all in the family. Now, it does cause a lot of social problems for them in that when three or more men marry one woman, you end up with quite a few unmarried women in their society, and they certainly value marriage as that's the way they get land and take care of themselves. And also, the youngest male often ends up leaving because they're not going to actually have children of their own because that wife might think of them more as a little brother and less as a husband, right? So you tend to have families being split up and the youngest members of this family eventually leaving. So one of the most important aspects of marriage that your culture answers for you is where the married couple lives um, after getting married. Now in our society, we practice neo-locality, meaning that when a couple gets married, they're expected to go out and buy their own house or at least get an apartment and then raise their immediate family by themselves. But in the past, that wasn't always the case, and it's certainly not the case everywhere even today. Um, in a matrilocal pattern, when a couple gets married, they live with the bride's family. In a patrilocal pattern, when the couple gets married, they live with the uh, husband's family. Now, in an ambilocal society, they live with either the husband's or the wife's family, um, but they pick one. And believe it or not, they can go back and forth throughout their lifetime. Uh, mostly these are linked to kinship patterns, which we'll talk about next week. Patrilocal marriage pattern being linked to patrilineal kinship. Matrilocal marriage residence pattern being linked to matrilineal kinship. Ambilocal being linked to ambilineal. And often uh, neolocality, what we practice, being linked to what we call bilineal kinship, meaning that you think of both the mother's and father's side as your family. Um, but keep in mind that this was pretty common, matrilocality and patrilocality in the past, and it's very common amongst farming families, right, where um, one side or the other needs to keep family or a land in the family, and so they'll bring in more people uh, to help run the farm, and they'll all live in one big house with an extended family. In many societies, it's very common for one family or the other, the groom's family or the bride's family, to actually pay uh, for the right uh, for that person to enter into the other pattern. And in fact, there's or family, and in fact, there's still the vestiges of that um, in our culture, in Westernized culture. So anthropologists divide the various payments that can be made for marriage into three different categories, those being bride wealth, bride service, and dowry.
Bride wealth is when money or valuable goods are paid by the groom and or his family to the bride's family upon marriage. Um, this is also called bride price. Uh, sometimes the bride price or bride wealth can be as small as one goat, as pictured here. Um, this is very common among pastoralist societies, people that have large amounts of land, livestock. The new heir, for instance, are known that when you have a woman marry into your family, you have to compensate the family uh, that she is leaving by giving them cattle. The new heir are one of my favorite uh, societies, especially pastoralist societies, they have a lot of interesting uh, rules about owning cattle and how bride wealth slash, slash bride price should work. Um, because normally when you practice bride wealth or bride price, uh, you see extreme gender stratification, meaning women's rights usually are not as good. But the interesting thing the New Air do, they're a uh, Northern African group, is that while only men can own cattle and while women's marriage is paid for, uh, in cattle, women have the unique ability is that they are the only ones allowed to milk cattle. Um, so their power lies in the fact that they are the only ones to extract milk from cattle, which is very, very important to them. Uh, but even though they themselves can never own cattle. Bride service is often found among hunter-gatherer societies and often found among matrilineal societies. Um, and that's when the groom kind of has to go on uh, test working outings with the bride's family. Um, so basically the groom works with the bride's family and their her family decides whether or not he's worthy to marry their daughter. Um, this isn't just always a couple days, even though it is just a couple days for some societies. In some societies, it can last as long as seven years. Um, it is known that cross-culturally, traditionally in-law relationships, so your relationship with your father-in-law or mother-in-law can be very, very stressful. Um, and that's certainly true in our society, especially uh, for, you know, if you're male, your father-in-law, or if you're female, your mother-in-law. And so I think this was actually put into place to make sure that those people were going to get along. Um, and like I said, it's very common in matrilineal, matrilocal society. So basically they get to try out the, gr the groom before they come live with them and make sure it's okay. So it's known cross-culturally that that relationship is always tricky. Um, and so this is just a cultural pattern to kind of make sure that that's going to work out. So dowry was practiced by Western European cultures in the past. This is when a payment is required to either the husband or the husband's family uh, by the woman's family, the bride's family. Um, in some cultures, this was considered her inheritance, that basically they were, she was leaving their family and so they were giving her her inheritance early. Um, and there, I know some people that I grew up with still had a dowry box. And in many times the dowry box was like a, quilts, uh, cooking utensils, very gendered uh, labor, division of labor kind of stuff that they intended to hand down to their daughter when she got married. Um, and there's still the vestiges of this in our society in that it is traditional for the bride's family to pay for the wedding that is similar and related to the concept of dowry. Um, and this was a practice that was really important in medieval Europe, uh, almost to the point of at times bringing uh, to the brink, bringing uh, European, especially among poor European individuals during the medieval period, to crisis. Uh, at one point, it was required that all women get married with a dowry, and many families were simply too poor to provide one. So there were actually Christian uh, Catholic charities set up so that poor people could donate to a dowry charity such that uh, women with less money could actually even get married at all. There was actually becoming a bit of a population problem uh, because poor people weren't getting married because they simply couldn't afford their dowries. Um, and so Christian churches had to take action and start taking collections to provide dowries to people so that they could get married and continue to increase the population amongst the farmers who, of course, needed kids to help them on the farm. So the last thing we're going to talk about is marriage among the Nayar of northeastern India. It's the not that it's a strange marriage ceremony. It's just that it's the most 
different from our concept of marriage. So basically the point being that if you accept this previous marriage ceremony, the, the ceremony of the Nayar, as being a legitimate ceremony, then basically every culture on the planet has some form of marriage. So the way this worked is very uh, foreign or different to us, but be sure to keep a culturally relativistic perspective. So the first ceremony that occurred was called the tally tying ceremony. Uh, during this, older men, older established uh, prestigious men, would come over from the next village, and young women aged six months to, for, to 12 to 14 years uh, were wedded in the ceremony. And um, if the women were old enough, uh, sometimes the marriage was consummated, though this was very, very common. Keep in mind, adulthood is relative in the society at the time. Being 14 years old was adulthood. Um, but if that happened, and of course, they wouldn't have sex with a six-month-year-old or anything like that. It was on the 12 to 14-year-old end. Um, most times, this wouldn't happen. Uh, but from then on, those two people were considered married. However, they didn't really see each other after that. Um, and they had no really responsibility towards each other. All right, so these women who have under, undergone the tally tying ceremony, when they come to age, um, they can have sex with other men who will father their children who are not the man uh, from the other village that they went through the tally tying ceremony with. These visiting husbands are known as Sambadham. Uh, and a woman can have several of these husbands at once. And while people might tease people about it, or they did when they were, this cultural uh, phenomenon was in place, they know what's going on and it's culturally accepted. So these younger men uh, who are probably from the same village, maybe from other villages, will actually biologically father these women's children. But in terms of inheritance, they will be the children of the man who participated in the tally tying ceremony from the next village. When the man who is involved in the tally tying ceremony dies, and keep in mind he was older, so that might be pretty soon, the woman must dance at his funeral and all of her children inherit the man's status and possessions so while this isn't a marriage ceremony in the sense that it's like our westernized marriage ceremony it does satisfy pretty much all the definitions of marriage and then it determines who will biologically father children it determines who will culturally father the children it determines who takes care of the children uh the woman and her female relatives um and it, it determines inheritance of goods and items and causes these alliances not only between families, but also between different villages because titles and inheritance is constantly moving from one village to the next. So you can't really go to war on the next village because you're tied to them literally uh, based on these tally tying ceremonies, right? Um, so while it is very, very different from what you think of as being marriage, um, it does satisfy all parts of the definition. Um, and not only that, serves to move goods around. So why this came about, uh, we think, was because the men in this society <clears throat> were known to be kind of berserkers. Uh, they were well-known soldiers who uh, went to war often and went to war in a very risky manner. And so uh, you had a significant lack of young men that survived military service to father children. And so if a man had survived military service, he had gathered up a great deal of inheritance, goods, and titles. Um, but by the time he came back from that military service, he was pretty old. So this ensures that the biologically young are the people actually uh, fathering and mothering the children, you know, producing the children, genetically speaking, and that the older men who survived war can pass on their goods and titles. Right. So while it's very, very different from our definition of marriage, uh, it is a marriage ceremony, anthropologically speaking. And the reason I bring it up is it's so different from ours that if you accept this ceremony as a marriage, then pretty much all ceremonies or all marriages are, are similar enough to ours to be considered marriages, right? All right, well, that's all I've got for marriage uh, and look forward to the lectures on kinship.